The untold story of war production. All wars are about competition in production. The side that can produce more is always going to triumph. This is a war between the factories. The real story of how the world wars were fought and won. It may sound strange, but modern wars, they're not won by battles, they're won by factories. They swamped the other side with a tide of mass production. And those factories would shape the modern world. Volkswagen, Fiat, Mitsubishi, they're all household names now, but they made those names as war factories. Now get back to work. On the 5th of December, 1916, workers in a factory on the outskirts of Leeds began their night shift. Minutes later, a deafening explosion shattered the night. A massive explosion took out an entire machine. You have lots of bits of concrete falling out the sky. Fire, fumes, smoke, horrendous. Dozens lost their lives and many more lay injured. Some of them were only able to be identified by the identity tags that they wore. Not a word of this would reach the outside world. The victims were never acknowledged. It was all hushed up. No account of the incident was made in the national news, but the people who lost their lives knew the risks that they were taking. This was total war. This was a war beyond their imagining. Far from the trenches and craters of no man's land raged an unseen war that broke tradition, risked lives, and rebuilt a nation. You had to turn all of Britain into one giant factory. A war that saw millions answer the call. If they'd not been there, we would not have won the war. August 1914. Britain, along with France and Russia, had declared war on Germany and its Austro-Hungarian allies. The British Expeditionary Force was mobilised and departed for the front. We actually send overseas seven divisions. It's about 150,000 soldiers. It quickly became apparent that this was a war like no other. Much to the shock of all the nations fighting in the First World War, the war they were fighting was a completely different one than they expected. Everybody had planned for a moving type of warfare and a mobile warfare. But what happens when the war begins is that goes completely out of the window. Gone were the old tactics, the cut and thrust of previous military engagements. Now every inch of land was hard fought and bitterly held. What they found was a war in which they were digging into the ground and creating giant trench systems with millions of soldiers staring at each other over what aptly came to be known as no man's land. Soon, a system of defenses grew to encompass the whole of the Western Front. 440 miles of trenches, dugouts, and barbed wire that stretched all the way from the Swiss border to the North Sea. You can't go forward or push the enemy back, so they begin to dig in their positions to hold as best they can. Once you move into that war of attrition, the trench and warfare, the way you prepare for the attack and then hold the enemy off if they counterattack is by use of artillery. As the war ground to a standstill, vast fortifications were constructed on both sides. Soon, the only hope that any military operation had of success was to pound these positions into the mud. What becomes clear to the authorities is that in order to give your men the best chance, you really need to support them with as much artillery as you can muster, which is when you get barrages come in prior to them going over the top. You want the artillery to pound the living daylights out of the enemy before your men attack on foot. This moment became known by historians as the Guns of August. The government of Prime Minister Herbert Henry Asquith 
was woefully unprepared for this new type of warfare, which was, at the time, the complete opposite of British military doctrine. The main British force that went over to France to, to start fighting World War I was the British Expeditionary Force. And they were actually a, primarily an infantry force. That meant they relied on their rifles, their accurate shooting, and their individual soldiers to, to fight battles. They only had 29 million artillery shells stored and ready to go. And while that sounds like a lot, that actually was only about four big battles by the British government's reckoning. And the feeling is that the war will be over by that point anyway. When that doesn't happen, Britain has begun a war which really, it's not a position to finish. By the end of 1914, only 5% of the 10 million shells ordered for the British Army had actually been delivered. Shell stores soon ran dangerously low, and Britain's war factories struggled to keep up. Before the First World War started, Britain had a fairly limited ability to produce munitions. They had a small army, they had enough production capacity to equip that army, but they didn't have a lot of ability to expand that production quickly. But also as well, you have to remember that Britain's had a liberal government several years before the war, and liberal government didn't like spending money on war. So traditionally, the army shrinks, armament shrinks, the budgets go down. This lack of preparedness for modern warfare was badly exposed when British High Command ordered a major offensive at the front. The British Army had planned and mounted attack at a place called Aubers Ridge in France on 9th May 1915. The offensive was intended to exploit Germany's diversion of troops to the Eastern Front. British artillery, numbering over 500 guns, was charged with knocking out German defences before the big push. But the lack of munitions meant shelling could only last a mere 40 minutes. Tens of thousands of shells are, are made available, but actually the number of shells is inadequate. Some of the guns are rationed to 10 shells a day when they need 10 a minute. And soldiers in trenches can survive particularly a weak barrage. Then you advance, and all the enemy does is catch your soldiers in the open with their own returning artillery fire. The attack lasted only a day, but resulted in over 11,000 British casualties, the vast majority falling within yards of their own front lines. It had been a catastrophic disaster. The commander of the British Army, Sir John French, complained about that to the correspondent of the London Times, who was actually over uh, with the British Expeditionary Force in France. On the 14th of May, 1913, the London Times led with a devastating headline. The public and parliament were outraged at the idea that the British soldiers didn't have the equipment they needed, and they demanded answers. It nearly destroys Aswith's government. It does destroy the Liberal government in that he has to form a coalition going forward. But the coalition would only last if it could deliver enough shells to the front to make a difference. So what Asquith did was turn to one of the youngest and most aggressive of the liberal politicians in the cabinet, David Lloyd George. Lloyd George was the Chancellor of the Exchequer and had gained a reputation as an apt politician, earning him the nickname the Welsh Wizard. Lloyd George Asquith thought had the kind of aggressiveness and intelligence that could turn this situation around. The Asquith government passed the 1915 Munitions of War Act and created the Ministry of Munitions. David Lloyd George was appointed its first minister. He was now in charge of all the munitions production in Britain. The coalition and the nation could only survive if the shell crisis could be fixed. His task was monumental. The stockpiles in the UK are getting absolutely diminished. There was a desperate scramble to start creating more production, more munitions and more factories that would create the weapons they needed to fight the war. To do this, Lloyd George not only had to remake an industry, but revolutionise an entire society. All the while, on the front lines, the guns of August kept firing. On the 9th of June, 1915, 
David Lloyd George took charge of the newly formed Ministry of Munitions. His mission was to solve Britain's shell crisis and keep the guns firing. We have insufficient shells of the correct calibre. Many of them are shrapnel shells, which are very good against men in the open, but if the enemy are behind a trench or in a dugout, well, to be honest, you might as well spit at them. As trench warfare took hold, Germany poured in resources to secure its early advances. The German positions are so strong and so effective. I mean, they're in concrete bunkers dozens of feet underground, so you're going to have artillery blasting them off the face of the earth. Shrapnel shells couldn't pry the enemy from their dug-in positions. British forces now had to rely on high-caliber, high-quality artillery shells to blast them out. And very, very importantly, a lot of those shells simply don't function because they've been produced by factories at the outbreak of war were producing kitchen sinks or toys. They are not really prepared for the job. Lloyd George's task was made even more difficult by Britain's lack of industrial mobilisation. The problem with Asquith's government was they felt it was not really their role to intervene in the running of companies. So they left it to the individual companies to improve their ability to produce shells as they saw fit. The result of this lack of direction is that by the spring of 1915, only 50% of the small calibre artillery shells that had been ordered had been delivered and of anything above really the six inch shell, about a third was actually produced and available. It was a catastrophe. At the time, Britain's munitions industry only had three dedicated state-controlled war factories to supply its armed forces. There is a gunpowder factory at Waltham Abbey. There's a small arms factory at Enfield Lock, but the overwhelming amount of work is done at Woolwich Arsenal, and that has been Britain's premier site for artillery and munitions and armaments since the 17th century. These war factories were supplemented by a range of private ventures, but as the war progressed, demand quickly outstripped supply. The government needed to ramp up to millions of shells rather than thousands of shells. Factories in the country just couldn't keep up with the amount of munitions that they were being asked to produce. They didn't have enough staff, they didn't have the facilities. You've got to remember it was the first fully industrialised war. If Lloyd George in the Ministry of Munitions was to succeed, he had to move quickly. Lloyd George ran his ministry with a mixture of cunning and head-breaking. The first thing he did was to call in all of the factory owners, all of the industrial producers, and start getting them to work figuring out how to improve munitions productions. If they didn't want to cooperate, he threatened them with serious consequences. But he also schmoozed them and made them want to cooperate. And through this combination of good cop, bad cop, he managed to get most of those factory owners on his side and on the side of the British war effort. But the factory owners were the least of Lloyd George's problems. By 1915, Germany's advance into France had been checked, but at a terrible cost. The original expeditionary force had been virtually wiped out, suffering a monstrous 90,000 casualties. What remained was divided into two new armies, both in desperate need of fresh recruits. From 1914 to at least 1916, when you get conscription, the loss of male labour was massive. A lot of the skilled mechanics and producers who they needed in the factories were actually already on the front lines fighting that war. So the only way to really replace that was to bring women in to do these roles. Before the Great War, a woman's role was in the home. Jobs in society were mostly the preserve of men, and any woman in full employment was considered to be neglecting her domestic responsibilities. The employment of women in factories is an issue at the beginning of the war with trade unions. Then it's another thing that needs to be negotiated because as well as restricting people on bringing in a less skilled person to do their job, there's also restrictions on bringing in a woman to do their job. Trade unions had been dragging their feet about putting women into factories. If women could do it, then it wasn't a skilled job. Therefore, the wages didn't need to be as high. 
therefore men returning at the end of the war wouldn't need to be paid as much. It would have devalued the whole system. Factory owners also believed women weren't ready to join the workforce. In 1915, the government created the initiative of the Women's War Register to see who would be willing to work in industry and nursing and things like that. And a month later, 79,000 women had signed up and said, we will work in industry. And this was something that Lloyd George championed because he knew that they had to have these schemes to show that women were willing to work to kind of force the rest of the government to come in line and get these women into the factories. It was a gamble, but it paid off. Yes, there was chaos. Uh, yes, it was disorganised. It's very much like everything in this war. It's off the cuff, it's learning on the go and uh, evolving on the move. But to be fair to Lloyd George, yes, he did create a more smooth running and upscaled manufacturing process in Britain to get the munitions made. New practices and techniques also boosted Britain's war factory production. So what you have in the First World War is the advent of the assembly line. This allows a number of relatively unskilled people to carry out a process in a repetitive way, producing a linear production line, giving you results at the end. This breakdown of skilled to semi-skilled labour was known as dilution. Dilution is necessary because before the war, maybe it was OK to have one highly skilled guy that could do a whole process that would take an entire day to achieve one bit of output. If you suddenly need 50 times that output, are you going to find 50 of these guys? No. So what you do is you go and recruit a load of minions and you bring them in and you put them in a line. And instead of the one guy doing everything to the end of the line, he teaches each minion to do a little part of the process. So that means that you can multiply your production capacity massively without finding huge amounts of people that are as skilled as that one man who used to do the job all the way through. The key thing is you don't need a, a small, tiny team of highly skilled people. You need lots of semi-skilled labour. Trade unions were far from happy with the idea of women taking men's work for lesser pay. Lloyd George knew all too well what these grievances could spell. Lloyd George had to worry about the people who were going to work on those assembly lines. And, and most important from his perspective was he had to stop the kind of strikes and general worker unrest that had so marked the British economy before 1914. The Defense of the Realm Act and, and other powers that Parliament gave him actually gave him the ability to legally forbid workers from going on strike and generally to take control of the workforce in the way that he thought most effective to build the munitions that the British needed. Still, to keep the unions on side, an agreement had to be reached. Women could only be trained to a semi-skilled level and must work under supervision. Lloyd George now had his labour force, but to get the factories he needed, he adopted a two-pronged approach. Some of it relied on private industry, on the factories that already existed that were owned by heads of industry and could produce more than they were. But some of it also relied on increasing government production. And, and in this area, he started what was called the National Factory Scheme where the government actually started building its own factories to produce munitions of all sorts. The national factories are a completely new innovation. This is government basically directing industry in a way that, that's never been seen before. Nothing like this has been attempted because what it's doing is basically making the needs of production subordinate to the needs of the state. A lot of Lloyd George's tactics were kind of harsh, but one of the things you have to keep in mind is that every day new casualty reports were coming home from the Western Front. Every day Lloyd George was being reminded of how many thousands of British soldiers were being wounded and killed. And that drove him to make sure that they had the kind of equipment that they needed to fight the war. A total of 170 factories were established throughout England. One of the brand new purpose-built factories was at Barnbow, just outside of Leeds. It would go on to become one of the most productive shell factories in the whole of Britain.
As the war in Europe escalated, Britain's stockpiles of ammunition were drastically reduced. Lloyd George and his recently formed Ministry of Munitions had to keep the country in the fight and fix its production shortfall. Near Leeds, one of the new generation of war factories was constructed. Valbo was a purpose-built factory and it was part of the network of shell factories that came about as a result of the, the shell crisis. The national filling factories were a particularly specialized kind of factory. They were responsible for essentially everything to do with making the explosive shell actually explosive. Built on a 400 acre site, the giant war factory had its own railway system, complete with an 800 foot long platform that allowed swift access to and from the site. The railway line came right into the heart of the factory and it also went all the way around the factory as well. They would offload all the goods into the centre of the site and they would be distributed to the different sections of the factory. Railways were critical for the national factories and Barnbo had its own 13-mile line that connected it to the national rail network. The national factories relied on a steady and immediate supply of raw materials. If the iron and steel didn't come in, the factories couldn't produce what they needed. And the only way to get what they needed into those national factories was through the railway. There's no suggestion in the Great War of putting ammunition on lorries, taking it to a railway station and loading it again. You take it straight from the workshop, put it straight on the train and off it goes down to the coast so that it can be put on a boat and sailed to France. Along with the shell filling works and cartridge stores, Barnbow also housed a tinsmith for renovating cartridge cylinders, a workshop that converted empty propellant boxes into packing cases, a laundry, a garage, and it even had its own fire brigade. Barnbow wasn't just a factory on its own. It's like a city within a city. But the threat of war was never far away and the Royal Defence Corps ran around the clock security, with workers made to wear IDs and carry permits. Ninety-three per cent of the workforce were women, and 130,000 women actually applied to work at Barnbo. They took on about 20,000, 19, 20,000. Fifty of them went down to Woolwich Arsenal to be trained, and they came back and disseminated the training to, to the other people. Within months, Barnbo was producing 50,000 shells a week, and each shell had one single purpose. Munitions factories in the Great War produce a range of projectiles, and this is just one of them. This is the standard British 4.5 inch howitzer shell. It's called 4.5 inch because that's the diameter of the shell. And what we've got here is the main body factory filled with explosives. But to actually get it to go through the air, to fire it, you need to have the shell case pre-prepared with charges. We've actually got a little percussion cap which is struck by a firing pin. That will cause our cordite to burn, explode in the weapon, forcing the propellant to actually push this projectile up the barrel. It will then fly through the air to whatever range you've already designed it to go, but when it strikes the ground, then the fuse at this end is crushed, and the crushing action causes the detonation of the main body of the shell. In detonating, it then causes all the explosives inside our projectile to themselves detonate causing the casing to break into fragments, hundreds if not thousands of red-hot, jagged pieces of steel. Shells were assembled 24 hours a day in a three-shift system. The demands of war meant no let-up for Barnbow workers. Working hours were extremely long. On average, eight-hour shifts, 12-hour shifts on a Sunday, just doing the same repetitive work over and over, day in, day out. There were no holidays because these women were crucial to the war effort. Every hour was dedicated to shell production. You can't leave your machine without permission. If you're late in the morning, the machine is disabled and you get no money at all for that shift. So you have to be on time, do what you need to do, 
And frankly, you know, if you need to go to the loo, you've got to time it pretty damn carefully. Full employment was ensured by high wages, far above average women's rates. The basic pay was 28 shilling a week, but they could earn up to three pound on bonus. These working class women were now able to act like upper class women. They were able to buy fur coats. Having money to spend on taxes, having money to lend. For once, they were the ones supporting their families and they were the ones with this spending power that they would have never had before. That spending power gave them a new freedom, but such behavior was often frowned upon. They enjoyed a lifestyle that they could simply never have thought of having. These working class munitionettes were definitely kind of acting out of their normal behavior. There are anecdotally stories about how boisterous the girls were. It was said that if a lone man got into a carriage full of bamboo girls, he did so at his own peril. And certainly there's a story of a man who was going to York and um, by the time he arrived at York, he had been debagged. This newfound autonomy was sometimes ridiculed in the press. In newspapers, there was a massive sense that uh, munitions workers were acting above their station. Quite a lot of the time, they discuss munitions workers in quite derogatory ways. But good wages weren't the only reason these women took up roles in Britain's war factories. They also felt that they could help support their menfolk who were fighting at the front line. There was a, a great sense of patriotism. These women, they were not there solely for the money. They wanted to win the war and they wanted to do everything that they could in order to do that. Along with high earnings, a number of innovations were also incorporated into the factory's design. You want these workers to spend nigh on every waking hour at this factory, but to some extent they have to want to be there. There were three canteens. They had a medical department, a dentist, they provided leisure facilities. The management were certainly very conscious that, that they had to look after their workforce. Soldiers were expendable, unfortunately, but these women were not so expendable because without the shells that they were producing, we would just would not have won the war. Not far from the main shell factory, a separate factory was also constructed. Its production was top secret. One of the innovations that the national factories created was a new kind of shell filling. They actually started using something called amatol, which was a mixture of ammonium nitrate and TNT to fill the shells that they were producing there. It was much more efficient, it was much more stable than what they had done previously. It's usually in an 80-20% ratio. Obviously at the Bambo factory they were kind of experimenting to see what would make it more efficient and effective. The Amatol section was entirely separate to the rest of the factory and it was also protected by barbed wire and guards because the two sets of employees were not allowed to mix. They had ladies in red dresses outside the doors of the canteen who prevented anyone who wasn't an Amatol worker going in. This was because of the cross-contamination from chemicals that they were working with. These workers handled deadly toxins and for some, the effects were immediately visible. When you worked with Amatol, when you worked with the explosives, a fair amount of it migrated under your skin and turned you a quite an impressively bright yellow color. This earned them the nickname, the Canary Girls. The bright yellow skin is actually not really a joke. It had serious health consequences and it gives you a form of jaundice. It, it probably kills over 100 women. Others are very, very sick as a result of it. One canary girl later said, You expected to feel poorly. Our skin was perfectly yellow, right down through the body, legs and toenails even. The Ministry of Munitions realized these health problems and they fairly quickly introduced sets of protective clothing for the factory workers to wear. And that worked to reduce some of the health consequences. The need to improve health led to one surprising addition at Barnbo, its own farm. Housing 120 cows, producing 300 gallons of milk per day, it was a vital resource. The girls were involved in running the farm, producing produce for the canteen and the milk, because they were encouraged to drink the milk to counter the effects of the TNT poisoning. 
The farm also produced fresh vegetables and meat with its own on-site slaughterhouse and butcher. The girls were fed extremely well, certainly did far better than the average woman in the street uh, because uh, they had a lot of things on hand. The well-being of Barnbo employees was important, but in a factory full of explosives, danger was never far. The problem with mass producing explosives is if you run the assembly line 24-7, that means that at any one time, you have enormous amount of extremely dangerous material in the factory. You can only limit that danger as much as you can. There is always going to be some risk involved. The Ministry and Great Britain were winning the arms race, but this success did not come without sacrifice. In the first few months of the war, shell production was a mere 500,000 artillery rounds. By 1916, that figure had risen to a staggering 16.4 million. It was clear that war factories like Barnbo had played a major role in turning around Britain's fortunes. After 1915 and going into 1960, Britain had overcome to a large extent the problem of not producing enough shells. This rush to remake and rearm didn't just cost lives in battle, but also in war factories at home. There are some catastrophic accidents during the First World War. Probably the one that springs to mind for me is Silvertown, which is over in the Docklands area. It was a classic example of what goes wrong when you're trying to purify TNT in the middle of London. There was an explosion which killed workers on site. The explosion claimed 73 lives including many children, and injured over 400. But it also had a catastrophic effect on the local community. What happens at Silvertown is the explosive had to be got into the shells, and that job was done manually. But because of problems with melting the explosive, you have that risk that if you get it wrong, if there is a spark, then it would explode. Everybody's windows for a certain radius were blown out. You could feel it all the way into Essex. So, and, and what it did, the king went to see the site as soon as he got back from Sandringham, and he said, it's like a little bit of the Western Front in East London. The Ministry of Munitions tried to reduce these risks, and Barnbow was built with a number of special safety measures. They built, rather than one assembly line, a range of huts widely separated from each other. In each of these huts, some of the shell production would happen. Because of the separation, if one of the huts blew up and there was a lot of damage, it wouldn't extend to all of the rest of the huts. That didn't protect someone inside from getting blown up. That just meant if that person got blown up, the bits of them and the bits of the wooden hut they were working in would be contained. So the factory could keep going with production even if there was an industrial accident. Practices like these were the forerunner to modern health and safety. War changes the nature of industry in many ways. It brings in a series of acts which to do with health and safety, which means that actually it's safer to be in a factory at the end of the First World War than at the beginning of the First World War, purely because during the course of the war, we can't afford to lose labor and people and machines to accidents. Sadly, precautions could only do so much and the threat of tragedy haunted every working moment. Inherently, producing munitions and dealing with explosives and shells and fuses and all types of paraphernalia involved with destroying things is going to be dangerous. If anything goes wrong, then it's going to be really a very, very bad situation in the factory. For Barnbo, it was only a matter of time before risk became reality. Sadly, on the 5th of December, 1916, there was an explosion at the factory in Hump 42. What happened was an operator had six shells. She'd put fuses into two of them and tightened them up. She put the third one on and it exploded. This set off a chain reaction and detonated five other shells. The ceiling came down. There were fumes, there was smoke. It must have been horrendous. The entire room was devastated. 
There was between 170 and 175 operators working in that room. Some people were absolutely blown apart. Others were very, very seriously injured. And we've heard stories of people running away screaming. It was absolutely complete what was the devastation. In the mayhem that followed, one passing worker dared enter the ruined hut. A mechanic was walking by called William Parkin. Rather than run away from the incident, he actually ran towards it and he entered the hut at least 11 times. And he came out each time with an injured girl on his shoulder. I think if William hadn't have done what he did, more people would have died. He saved at least 11 lives that night. Sadly, 35 women perished from the accident. Some of them were only able to be identified by the identity tags that they wore. It was the first major loss of women civilian workers in the war, and a heartbreaking loss for Barnbow. Local historians recount one story of a young employee who, like so many underage soldiers, had lied about their age to sign up. Edith Sykes was only 15 years of age at the time. She shouldn't have been in the factory that night. She worked with her sister, her elder sister, Agnes. Agnes had the flu at the time. And Agnes should have been working, but Edith took her place. And as a result, she was caught in the explosion. She didn't die on the night, but she did die two or three weeks later. There was a lady from York. She was killed. Her husband walked the 20 miles from York to identify her body. And then they gave him a cup of tea and a bun and sent him on his way back to his family. And she left 10 children. Losing 35 people, it was tragic for a lot of the people that happened. And some people did never return to the site after that night. But in the grand scheme of things, much more was happening on the Western Front. The war was far from over, so Barnbow had to continue. Its production was just too vital. They cleared out the factory and the room was immediately put back together and the management asked for volunteers to go back and work in there and they were inundated with volunteers. Within 24 hours, Hut 42 was fully staffed and back in operation once more. People were straight back into work because they knew that they had a job to do. When explosions happened, it was kind of just collateral damage to the bigger picture of the war effort. There's just this spirit of, this is our war. These girls can't put on a uniform and hold a rifle in the trenches. That's what their brothers are doing, their fathers are doing, their boyfriends, their husbands, their sons. This is what they can do, and their commitment to this cause is therefore absolute. Due to the secret nature of Barnbow's production, the outside world received little notice of the incident. The victims of the explosion were never, ever really acknowledged. It was all hushed up, completely hushed up. The only clues to the tragedy were a short article that appeared in the local paper, which did not name Barnbow, and the death notices posted the following days, with cause of death given as accident or suddenly. They didn't want news to get through to the front, to the boys at the front. They didn't want to put people off from coming to work in the munitions factories. Workers at the Barnbow plant had their own ideas about what happened in Hut 42. My grandmother worked in the factory at Barnbow and her job was to put the fuse onto the 4.5 inch howitzer shell that we have here. Um, delicate job because you've got to locate the casing with a pin built into the machine and then the rotating element of the machine puts another pin in this and then rotates the whole thing down. Bearing in mind at this point that we've now got a shell full of high explosive with a cap going onto it, a fuse which if it goes off will set the whole lot off. On the day of the accident in December 1916, my grandmother was meant to start work at 10 p.m. She wasn't feeling well, so she wasn't going to go to work. She was going to stay at home. So someone else was operating her machine, which caused the explosion. My grandmother always said that the woman that replaced her was known to be clumsy. She was often told off for over-tightening the fuse. So the explosion was caused by the woman operating my grandma's machine 
who over tightened one of these fuses. However, despite the personal opinion of Andy's grandmother, the official inquiry found a faulty fuse was to blame. This accident was horrendous, but it wasn't the only one. It was happening in other parts of the country. Other lives were being lost. But if you're in the middle of a war, you have to carry on. You couldn't not provide the shells to the boys at the front. By the end of the war, Barnbow was one of Britain's premier war factories. Its workers had filled nearly 25 million shells, almost 15% of the total shells fired during the war by the British forces. I think the people who worked there were all extremely proud of what they'd done and very conscious of how much part of the war effort that they had been. After the armistice, many who helped Britain to victory soon found themselves unwanted. After the war, everything went back to normal. Women went back to their usual roles and they were kind of pushed out, don't talk about what happened. All these women who'd given their all were discarded. There was nothing for them. There was no provision made for them to go to work anywhere else. Understandably, the men were coming back from the front and they had to go back to their jobs. All they got was a little certificate, the size of a postcard, which said, this person worked at Bambo during the war. And that was it. Women workers saw their opportunities decline. And by 1919, over 600,000 women were registered unemployed. But the war years had left their mark on those who answered Lloyd George's call. I think it definitely changes women's opinions of themselves. However, I don't think that in many ways you can say that it fully liberated women because a lot of women didn't get the right to vote until 10 years after the end of the war. But I definitely think that it kind of pushed for a step in the right direction to actually say, women can do the same things as men and they'll do it just as well. The legacy of the Barnbo workers and all munitions workers was the remarkable change in Britain's fortunes during World War I. The ability of the British to create these war factories quickly, to, to remake their entire economy, to rebuild their munition production from the ground up, was perhaps the central reason why the British won the First World War. They equipped not only their army, but the American army with munitions, with machine guns, with artillery, and with shells. And that underpinned all of the fighting that defeated Germany. I think because the decisions taken in 1915, that model paves the way for what we see, particularly after the Second World War, in a way that you don't see in other nations. Britain makes a bold decision that victory will depend upon the means of production. And if that means central government taking control, that's the way it is. <laughs>